and today I'm joined here with Judith, uh, Judith Dawson and Louise Osmond, director and producer of the film Dark Horse. I'm Molly from Interfilm, Young Reporter. So first and foremost, how did you find the story? Was it a long time in the making or did it just fall into your hands? Oh my goodness, it was a long saga. <laughs> it started kind of accidentally in, in during what we tend to call the business development hell, when you're looking for ideas, can't find anything, you're unemployed, you're trying to think what the next job's going to be. <laughs> and uh, I'd been to the races one time after Christmas and thought that there was something lovely in the kind of idea of all these people putting money down to back and believe in a racehorse. I thought it was kind of vaguely Rocky-like. Anyway, that was the kind of fantasy I was engaged in, which of course led nowhere. And then, but searching around in kind of similar territory, it came upon this story and just kind of, it just literally leapt off the page because it had such beautiful kind of twists and turns in it and the characters sounded good, but obviously that's, you know, you just don't know. So I <laughs> somewhat cowardly called Judith and said like, you have to, literally, I think my words were something along the lines of if you do nothing else for the rest of your career, you have to call <laughs> these people and persuade them to let us make a feature documentary with them. So it's like no pressure, obviously, that was it. Yes, it was one of those moments <laughs> where I felt, oh my goodness, <laughs> I better get this right. So of course, in those circumstances, what you tend to do is put it off a little bit, you know, because what you don't want to do is make the call and for it not to elicit the right answer. You've got to have a yes because I've got Louise to answer to. <laughs> and it has to be a big enthusiastic yes. It has to come from exactly the right sort of person. Um, so it was, it was a bit nerve wracking, I have to say. And I did make the call and I got Howard first of all. He's a very enthusiastic man and absolute charming as they all are. And he said, uh, I'm driving at the moment. I can't really talk right now. And I said, oh, may I call you back later? He said, hang on, I'm pulling into a lay-by. Hour and a half later, <laughs> I'd heard a great deal about the story that I didn't know. And I thought he was wonderful because he was so fantastically articulate and enthusiastic and funny and lovely. And then after that, we spoke, he spoke to Jan and Brian and said, she sounds like a nice woman, you know, you really want to tie. I said, how would you know I didn't get a word in edgeways? But <laughs> all the same, we then got talking to Jan and Brian and then we went down to see them. But it, it, was, it was quite a long, slow mm. process. But what you never know what you're getting into, particularly if you've just read something. So what happened in those first few meetings and conversations is that it, you know, the, the story just expanded and deepened and they were more wonderful each time we saw them. So, you know, yeah. we were lucky. I was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> was it difficult to kind of gain the trust of such a tight-knit community and have them win the story so close to all of their hearts, so many people? Was it difficult to gain their trust or was it something that came, like, naturally? Um, no, I, th I mean, I think, I think kind of always when you're making documentaries, you kind of, the building of that relationship is key and central. And um, they kind of asked very little of us. I think they said early on the main criteria would be that we didn't make them look foolish. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, but it's a, a kind of, I think it's just, you sort of build that trust quite gently I think we would go we went down a lot and we spent some time down there I, they probably got completely fed up with these two old birds coming down from London <laughs> hanging out at the allotment but it was just a kind of way of getting to know them and uh, and then I think when it came time to film in the community that that was something that kind of fell I think quite heavily on Judith's shoulders because you know even though we were a small crew. It's still, you're kind of still, the danger is you kind of come in in your size nines and tread on local sensitivities. And so Judith was sort of, I felt, made that possible by being, she kept everything very, very personal. She, she kind of did it, kept a very personal hand on communications with people, I felt. I think what it is, is Louise said, um, absolutely vital to tread very carefully. And it's such a tiny place. 
I mean, I hadn't appreciated, first of all, A, quite how small it is, B, the fact that everybody is either related to each other or in a blood feud with each other, <laughs> <laughs> or both. And, um, it, you know, th there, there are complexities in relationships in any small place. And as Lou says, you know, you walk in in your size nines and trample about at your peril. So we were very, very careful. I think, I think possibly because it was a, such a small place, more respectful than we might even have been normally. We were very cautious about how we treated people. And I think in that way, sort of, we had time for people to come to us. We didn't have yeah. to necessarily go to them mm. because they all know each other. Then of course they would say, well, look, you know, they don't bite. It's going to be fine. It'll be absolutely okay. And if you want to get involved, do. And so by the time we started gathering people, because the only people in the film are from the village, apart from the trainer, um, the, the, everybody sort of knew who we were in a way, didn't they? Mm. And so it, it made it, but you could, it wasn't something you could build quickly. I, I would say that you had, we, had, we were lucky to have the time we did. Yeah, no, definitely. I think it definitely comes through in the film as well. But we got a question from the Twitter Q&A. Um, did you always want to make a film about horses and people? Or again, was it one of those ones that found you? Well, I think, I think it was a kind of interesting process. And the initial idea had been, maybe there's something really interesting in, in the, the relationship that people form with racehorses. And that might be just punters putting down their money to bet on them and believing in them like a boxer or a footballer. Obviously, the story that emerged was completely different. And I think the thing, I don't think either of us had actually anticipated quite how much that would be at the heart of this story. But when, from the first time we went down there, it was obvious what an, what an emotional connection they had with the horse and what a, a kind of incredible journey they had been on with this horse. I mean, Howard's eyes would fill up just mentioning the horse's name and I, I think and that just literally kind of instantly became the heart of the film because what was so lovely about it was that it was kind of reciprocal you know they had the horse had given them so much maybe Jan particularly but then when the worst happened they stood by the horse so it had been this kind of beautiful journey and they'd kind of yeah and and he'd grown up there you know he'd grown up as a foal on the allotment so everyone sort of like a pyramid with slightly wider connections but everyone in the village had a kind of emotional connection to that horse which was was lovely so but when there are so many kind of different perspectives obviously there were so many members of the syndicate and there must have been so much that you could have put in the film so how did you kind of separate it and choose which strands were the most important and what would be most vital to making like a good documentary that really did it justice well, a, a sort of six foot three editor called JBG had quite a lot to do with it. He's <laughs> normally packed with opinions. Um, but yeah, I guess we sort of knew what the structure of the film was because it had this its own beautiful narrative structure. And I think probably the hardest part and definitely the part that probably gave each of us in different ways sleepless nights was the fact that there was only little clusters of material to illustrate, you know, a few stills here, a racehorse there and so forth. So everything in between was just a blank, a uh, black hole. <laughs> so kind of finding the form for the way to, you know, reconstruction of any kind, as anyone who makes documentaries will tell you, is a kind of, you know, you're between here and the abyss, <laughs> you know, because it's such a paper thin line between it working and not working. And that, that sort of so it was just a question of just pairing back and back and back in the edit until it really just became it kind of just, I would say, illustrative rather than reconstruction. I hate the word reconstruction. So I prefer illustrative footage. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's really, just generally, that's amazing to know for any kind of aspiring documentary makers. But from a producer and a director's point of view, what are your top tips? Top tips. Top tips. <laughs> I think you have to be pretty realistic. You have to know. I think our advantage was that we know each other well anyway. And not only did we talk to the characters a lot about the story, we talked to each other a lot mm. about the story. Mm. 
So, you know, it, we sort of absorbed huge amounts of it. I always thought of it as much as anything as a, as a, as a romance, the story, as a love story, love story between the horse and the people and reciprocated, but also a love story amongst them themselves, because I think their relationships with each other were very, very interesting. That, um, I, I think one of our more difficult tasks was finding the, the second level cast, if, you, if I'm, I'm not being rude to Tony and Maureen by saying that at all, because they were both absolutely wonderful. But they, you know, they, they, these four extraordinarily strong characters at the centre of the story. But there was 23 people at the, at the strongest part of the syndicate in the syndicate. And so we did have to talk to all of them. We wanted to include all of them, even if we, we couldn't use them. But we wanted them to know that, you know, we were interested in them. And then the other part of the story that I found very difficult as a producer was the race course part of the story <laughs> and permissions to be on race courses and things like that. And then, of course, permissions from the trainer and, and that, you know, not that they were difficult, but you have to do them. You have to know you have to do the difficult, a lot of the difficult stuff mm. first, don't mm. you? Because you've got this wonderful romance in the middle of it, but it needs its structure, its parameters, its 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 foundations to build the, the, the story that you want to tell or that Louise needed to tell around. So practical considerations first and yes. foremost, so everything else can grow from that. So going back to the film, um, obviously you've just kind of mentioned that there was 23 people and you kind of wanted everyone to feel involved even if they weren't necessarily as integral to the film as, as kind of Howard was. But did you have to work hard to get the story out of them or were they just so excited to talk about it that it, it all kind of came out in one go? It was, <laughs> it was kind of, I would say, extraordinary. I don't think I've ever, or pr will ever, work on a film where uh, the cast had such a gift with words. I think it must be something in the water down there in Wales. But just, um, I think what was really interesting about it was they could speak so kind of fluently and you know, in such a kind of articulate and evocative way about the story and bring alive the experiences they'd been through. But I think the particular gift they had, and maybe this is a Welsh thing, is that they were able to do that in a way that was very emotionally connected. You know, they were able to tell their story in a very emotionally connected way, which is quite a hard thing to do if you ever imagine telling a story from your past in a way that conveys what you felt as it unfolded at the time and they just had that gift in spades so it was literally just kind of trying to create an atmosphere where they could sort of go back in time and tell their story in a kind of really nice warm kind of intimate atmosphere and the crew were great they were very quiet very warm kind of laid back crew and i think that helps hugely because mm. ultimately You've got, not unlike here, I might say, you've got a bunch of people standing around someone, there's lights, there's cameras, and, and I think anything that can help kind of relieve that and, and kind of take it away from being a mechanical process, a filming process, is really good, really important. It's kind of like a, another top tip, but when, so when you've got these people, and you mentioned that you didn't, you didn't want, they didn't want to look foolish, because it could have been very easy to kind of play on the fact that they were all like from this small town, like working men's club and whatnot. So did it come with a really big certain amount of responsibility and ethical considerations to take into account when you were kind of approaching the story and then going into the edit? Probably the bi biggest ethical consideration was Wales versus England. <laughs> so I think they had this sort of historic sense that, that English people would make Welsh people look foolish, but while we were down there, because we would keep going down over a period of time, England would play Wales at the Six Nations in rugby, and you know you could our reception, the warmth of our reception would would vary depending on whether <laughs> Wales had won, which they did unfortunately quite regularly, or whether we'd done well, in which case there'd be a slightly frosty silence. Yeah. So, what is the biggest challenge in directing and producing the film, and perhaps not just this film, but in general, what's the biggest difficulty you kind of come across? or the hurdle that always seems to pop up every single time? Wow, that's corker. That's a hard one. 
That's, that's over to that's you. That's actually, to, to yeah, yeah. I knew, <laughs> I knew, I knew it was going to be over to me. <laughs> <laughs> if I may, while I'm scrambling around in my head to the, pick up on what of what you were asking about the um, about not making them look foolish, which was a million miles from our thoughts when you mentioned it, because they mentioned it. Um, it is, I think, their also their feelings about you know the world that they had entered when they bred uh, a horse. It isn't unusual for um, you know, working class, ordinary people to be in a syndicate to have bought a bit of a horse. You know, 10 people buying um, a leg and a bit of this and a bit of that and a tail. But for people to have actually bred a horse elevates you in the horse racing world and particularly steeplechasing into you know, the owner's enclosure, the owner's restaurant, the owner's and breeders, you know, you get your special tickets. It's a very elitist sport, as I'm sure you know. And it's, and it's so, th it was, that's why they f feared being made foolish, that they would look like, you know, the, the, the poor folk from down the lane mm. uh, in amongst all these posh folk. But actually, it, it was never anything that we ever went anywhere near and didn't want to. I mean, because of course, you know, they're, they're very proud and they've, and, they've, and they've achieved something extraordinary. They've achieved something, you know, pretty much unique. Um, other people may have bred a horse, but I don't think they bred a horse that won. <laughs> no, of course not. It's amazing. You were saying um, before we came down here that the chances that they would even get the horse on a racetrack was ridiculous. Yes. So the, yes, fact the that odds were so long on it that you would never put your money on it, not even a pound. <laughs> yeah, no, of course not. But so what did the members of the syndicate actually think of the film? Like when they went to go and see it, did did they really feel like Oh that's interesting. They'd got it. Well we got had, it. It's always for any documentary you make it probably the most traumatic period of making it is when you have to show it to your contributors, which normally you'll do kind of very close to the end. And uh, we went down there, and it's it's always scary. And we went down. It was in Howard and Angela's house, and uh, press play. Five minutes into the film, Howard stops it and leaves the room. Oh so no! Think, oh my goodness! This is the one. This is the film where the contributors are going to say, you know, this is not the film you told me you were making. You know, I'm deeply unhappy with this. And he came back a few minutes later and his eyes were a bit red and his <laughs> tear-stained cheeks. And <clears throat> this is the way the film progressed. That's the way we watched the entire film, is in five and ten minute bursts where Howard would lead through. Um, and I was, of course, worried about, you know, the flow of the film, but nothing of it. It was just, it was great. And they were so generous. I think, honestly, they were more concerned to put us at ease than to, you know, they'd say, well, that's a nice shot. You know, they were more concerned with kind of putting us at ease than, than giving a response to the film. They're just incredibly kind of generous that way so that's fantastically <coughs> generous I mean that I don't think they they raised one objection at all I think that you know they were they were I mean I even said to them that day I said we don't actually know what you think because you're so polite and you're so charming and you're so lovely that what will happen when we leave the room? I'm never going to use a, leave a recording device here to find out what you actually <laughs> think. But I think they were being honest, and it was a, it was a most wonderful moment because it is nerve-wracking, it is isn't nerve it? I think Brian was slightly nonplussed that we'd taken him to film his interview in a shed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's my <laughs> favourite really location. <laughs> I think it's be absolutely beautiful, isn't it? And it, it isn't just because, you know, he's a man who looks at home in a shed, <clears> though he does. You know, you could put him anywhere and he's at home. Louise has just been with... Um, Jan and Brian to America for the opening of the film in America. And they were absolutely at home wherever they oh, went, weren't the they? the stars of the show. Yeah, they're fantastic. And the Americans really took to the story. They loved it and they completely got Jan and Brian and what Jan was trying to do with it. They just understood Jan's journey so well and so clearly. So that was lovely. It was lovely to sort of see her getting all this love over there. It was great. And they charmed them. They really did. They kind of charmed the audiences. It was brilliant. Yeah, that's amazing. It sounds like it must have been so rewarding 
And that's really great, actually, because we've just had another question from Twitter saying, what's your favourite part of the filmmaking process? Is it the getting ideas, the filming, the editing, or just seeing that you've really have nailed telling a story and all of these people who've contributed can kind of back that up for you? So I, I find it's a, it's a really interesting process because it sort of goes in waves. Like, in the beginning, you have the kind of euphoria of... Um, the sort of idealistic version of how it's going to be, which is like, this is amazing, we're going to be making this film about a horse in this beautiful valley in Wales. And then there's kind of the reality of actually making it yeah. and the filming and trying to get it right. And, right and, the, fact, <laughs> and the fact it was Wales <laughs> and you're trying to plan your filming schedule oh. and it rains and it rains and it rains. <laughs> <laughs> and you have, we, had to be, we had to be pretty flexible about, you know, we could call people at the last minute and say, we're not going to be outside today, we're going to do the, the scene in the Working Men's Club in, instead. And so you round up all your people who you'd actually said you wanted on Saturday, they have to come in on Tuesday because it happens to be raining, you know. So there was a lot of that, but we were small enough to be mm. flexible, I think, and we knew everybody well enough so that we didn't have to speak to anybody's agent and <laughs> have a new negotiation mm. about how we were going to continue with the week's work mm. yeah and, and I do love the edit I have to say I do because the edit is such a kind of it's such a I love it as a journey and oftentimes you'll start somewhere and you'll kind of try various things and move away from there and you might come back and you rework sequences and things change and you try something somewhere and it doesn't work and then you put it somewhere else and it suddenly comes to life and uh, it's great and as I mentioned Joby but you know he's integral to the film it's you know it's it's a great sort of real kind of collaboration and it's it's great fun and it, <coughs> when you're working with somebody you enjoy working with it it just makes it a really a good fun journey so. is it difficult to step back from though sometimes when, when you've worked so closely with all these people and then when you're in the edit is it difficult to kind of step back and decide like what bits are most important because with all these people they've been so cooperative and so welcoming that it must have been quite difficult to kind of take these bits and pieces out of the film because it needs to be an hour and a half. Well, what's what's really interesting is you then kind of go through a layer of filters, if you like. So, so Joby obviously knows none of that. All he sees is the person on the screen. Do I respond to them? Don't I? Do I understand the story they're telling me? Do I kind of understand why it meant something to them? So his questions are deeply practical and sort of unsentimental in a way. And that's the first filter. And then, of course, once you've done your rough cut, then you're presenting to your executive producers and it's the same for them. You know, they might, we probably had played them little bits and pieces so they could get a sense of the film that was coming. But then same thing for them. Do I understand the story? Do I understand what it means so much to Jan? So it's kind of, it's fresh. You, you get layers of fresh eyes on the film. So however kind of <coughs> close and involved you were at the time, you're kind of, <coughs> you're, you get to step back that way, which is great. Yeah, that sounds really good. So we kind of touched on this before, but it's a question that keeps coming up. So what is the most important advice you could give to a young person who doesn't really know much about documentaries, but is interested to kind of follow in your footsteps and find a place to start? I, <coughs> it is such a difficult question, but I, I would say I would say probably the first thing is in the selection of the idea, which is a really tough thing to say because you know, I'm just about to embark upon that now, having just finished a project, and it's just, it makes your heart sink because you kind of feel, how will you find it? But I think the thing is trying to look in areas that you feel might kind of set something on fire for you. You think, I would love to make a film that is in that world or that involves those issues. And, and then really trying to invest time, trying to find an idea that excites you. And then if you can get the money to make it, which is obviously a big battle in itself. Learn to pitch well and learn people who can give you pitch mm. advice. Mm. But once you've, if you can get the financing, really, 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 really spend time looking for the right people to make it with. Look for the best people, because that collaboration will bring, each person will bring their talents to the film. You know, the composer brings a whole other thing to the film. The editor brings their huge talents to the film. DOP brings theirs. and. I think it's just finding people who you want to work with, who you're going to enjoy working with, who are you know super talented and committed. That journey that you all make together is the thing that will actually give you the most pleasure 
in the film, I think. So it's, I know it's tough though, it's tough, but it's worth it because it's the best job in the world. I do believe so, definitely. D documentaries, I might say. Documentaries always. We had like a mini <laughs> masterclass as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's none of this narrative feature nonsense. Yeah, <laughs> documentaries are a cool bit. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to us. It's been so insightful. The film's amazing. So thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you for all your questions. And please tune in to the next BFI Insider. <laughs>